Good morning, everybody. Morning out here for me, maybe a different time out there for you. Welcome to my channel. My name is Margaret Pennard. I'm a historical fiction and fantasy writer and eclectic reader. Feel free to check out the channel. I've got loads of playlists and books and karaoke times. So welcome, welcome, welcome. What is it today? It's Wednesday. So we've got a wrap up for November and a little bit of December because it was a slow month and things just sort of stretched into December. So we're going to take it a few books at a time. I chopped them up into little, little pieces and uh, reflect on what we did in November. So I only ambitiously aimed for two readathons. There's two big readathons in November. There's nonfiction November run by a book olive and there's Skodan, which is taken over from Indigathon run by Native Lady Book Warrior. And both had various prompts, pretty elaborate, lots of ways to participate. I was like, I can't can't handle all that. I'm not even doing nano. I don't even have that as an excuse. But I know that I can't handle all that because I'm traveling down. I'm going to be around family. I've got the book follow-up launch stuff. Like, I'm just going to take it easy on the reading side, right? So for those two, I have like four books that I did read, one and three. So we'll go through those first. Um, hey, Anita. Hey, Richard. Good morning. Good evening to all. <laughs> all right. So the first one is going to be for Skoden. And again, if you don't know, and I didn't know before Kim explained it to us, Skoden is like the smushed native way of saying, let's go then. And so they turned it into a, an inclusive term for this readathon of reading indigenous literature. And this is like a side, like it qualifies in my mind, but I, you know, not obvious to the casual observer. So this is one I had on my ancient TBR. It's called One Dark Body by Charlotte Watson Sherman. And it's actually a Pacific Northwest writer who is talking about different generations of African American experience. And it pops back and forth between different points of view, different times to sort of weave together these stories. Um, there is a lot of historical trauma that is sort of treated in a mystical or sort of tough rocks type way. So you get a lot of different treatments of this, of, um, here we go, of people's trauma. So it is a heavy book. It is a serious book. Um, the characters are really, really well drawn. The dialogue is very cutting and sharp. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> um, and very characteristic. You get a sense of the characters from hearing their voices. So I thought this was really well done. Um, I don't know if she's written anything else. I'd be curious, um, but I would recommend this for people. I think you'll have a vastly different experience depending on how much you've read of African-American literature um, and you know how well-versed you are in some of these experiences. But the reason it fits for Skoden is that the generations go back to keeping up traditions that were brought over from West Africa um, after the slave trade. And so there's a lot of uh, weight lent to people trying to hold on to their own um, uh, spiritual beliefs and their own souls and how they ground themselves and how they keep up the mysticism that allows them to feel free. And I really liked that part. So this is why I would recommend this book. Here we go. Number one. Unfortunately, that's the only indigenous lit I read. I started Braiding Sweetgrass later and I'm still reading it. And I'm not sorry because it is so good that I'm like taking it a chapter at a day or less so that I can absorb it and appreciate it. So. You know, we knew that was coming. <laughs> um, so jumping into nonfiction November reads, we've got three. The first one is one that you've heard me talk about several times because it took several months. This is a very old copy of The Social Thought of Jane Addams, edited by Christopher Lash. And as you can see, I had a lot of tabs to put in this. This is a research read for me. 
Uh, if you've been around on the channel before, you know that I read um, What Would Jane Do? or something like that, which was a, in the last 10 years, um, someone put together a how to plan Chicago um, urban planning alternate history. And if instead of Daniel Burnham of an 1893 World's Fair of fame, Jane Addams had been at the front of the the board of directors to direct the urban planning. Like how would things have been different? And she does these imaginary like boardroom meetings where Jane Adams and her contemporaries discuss like social issues and how you could address them. So I got, really got into Jane Adams and Chicago in that time period. She's a fascinating character, person who lived. And um, so the social thought is basically Christopher Lash going through Jane Addams' writings, some of which I had read already and I recognized from the first 20 years at Hull House, um, but others that I had not that were from much later, that were about the war, World War I, uh, and peace activism, but a lot of stuff that was also in like um, class stuff and labor issues and social issues. So it was really, really interesting. As you can see, I, I put lots of tabs in um, to come back to for, for research to use it in my Chicago novel. Um, but yeah, it's probably not easy to find. It's not on Bookshop. Um, I tried to look, I didn't find it, but you might, if you're interested in social labor history and the turn of the century and early 20th century, I highly recommend four star read. Very interesting. And I really appreciated Christopher Lash's comments. He introduces each of her pieces of writing with his own, um, this didn't age well, or this was the behind the scenes going on, or, um, you know, this wasn't her best writing, but expresses this part of her personality, which is really cool. So the Jane Addams research continues. Maybe the, maybe the Chicago novel will be veering left to become a biopic. Who knows? Hey, Shannon. Welcome, welcome. Nice to see you here. Okay, so the next nonfiction November pick is Who's Freedom? The Battle Over America's Most Important Idea by George Lakoff. And this, as you can tell, is a book on CD. Um, so yes, it's it's an older book. It's from 2006. And I think my parents had had it since then because it was still in plastic wrap when I picked it up. Um, it had been on my shelf for a while and I was like, it's 10 hours. My drive is 10 hours. I think this is the perfect read for me to drive 600 miles. Um, spoiler alert, it took me longer than 10 hours. So I went into December a little bit with this, um, but the ending was actually really good and I, I probably will need to listen to it again to get it because I was doing 15 minute drives around town. So I didn't get the full impact of like listening to it all at once. So basically, um, I think he's a like professor emeritus or runs a nonprofit institution now or something, but he's getting on. He is a cognitive scientist slash linguist. And back in 2006, he was struck by the George W. speech inauguration of 2005 and how conservative plan was coming together and they kept banging on the same words. And he's like, why are they banging on these same words so hard? What? That's got to be strategic. And so he used um, cognitive science about how we have frames to interpret words and we make assumptions about those words. And then he used his linguistics background to think about how we pack those words with assumptions. And so when you talk about freedom, I mean, beyond whose freedom you're talking about, which is important, there's also... Um, in the definition of freedom, you have other words that you assume you know, but are you agreeing on what you know those mean? So it was really interesting to see him unravel those. And then the ending piece that I really appreciated that I want to go back and listen to was about how to counteract the damage that has been done by co-opting those words over the last 15 years. And um, I mean, not 15 years for him, but you know, for us now. And he had some really good points, like don't use the conservative language because you're admitting their frame you're letting them frame the debate and really what you should be doing is like thinking um the the progressive vision like how do we 
expand freedoms for people? How do we express that in language and then use those words? So, um, if that bored you, <laughs> we should talk offline. <laughs> but uh, I really, really like that. So that was like a four, four point two five stars. Um, and again, it's backlist, two thousand six, but it's eerily prescient in that way where you're like Orwellian nightmare of using um, whatever the expression is for something that means the opposite. And he, he uses that a couple times to describe what's being done. So yeah, very good. Emma Bennett, romance author. Hello. Just cooking supper. Thought I'd pop in and say hi. Boop the like button. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's do that. Rachel is here. Hi, Rachel. Uh, I was going to wait till the end to do this, but hey, everybody, Rachel's going to be on my channel on Friday. I'm very excited. I've got, uh, look at the link. <laughs> so I'll put it up now. Um, just so everyone knows, Rachel is someone in the community who has two books out, who is like doing all the things in all the chats and would love to um, have people come and tune in to what we're going to talk about on Friday. Um, so yeah, so there's that. So that was two nonfiction. Final nonfiction November read was a more whimsical book. And I will put up the question of the day now because it concerns this. So, um, light nonfiction. Often when we talk about nonfiction, it's like history, politics, murder, true crime, whatever. And people are like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to read about that. That's like heavy on my heart or like it just gets me in a bad place. Nonfiction is a whole world, y'all. So look what I picked up. <laughs> the Perfectly Imperfect Home, How to Decorate and Live Well by ne Deborah Needleman. And um, she's founding editor of Domino Magazine, illustrations by Virginia Johnson. And as you can tell by looking at the title or the cover, the, um, the I guess it's watercolor illustrations are very whimsical. It reminds me a lot of another watercolor illustrator whose books I loved. Um, and it's just like pretty and fun. And you got to read Deborah's reasonings behind how to make your house feel cozy. And you kind of got a little bit more about how decorating works and how people think of things in terms of scale, in terms of colors. And it was neat. Uh, it's not heavy read. <laughs> um, it's it's highly illustrated. So when you go through, like, you know, there's some text, but it's like a magazine in a book. So I, I really enjoyed it. Took it little pieces at a time um, and had fun, like, browsing. I, I don't subscribe to any magazines anymore. I don't buy them. They're too expensive at the grocery checkout. So, like, I'm not paying $10 for a magazine. But at my local used bookstore, Backstory Books, I am happy to get a used hardcover version and browse it, you know. Um, so, yeah. So, the question of the day is, do you read light nonfiction? Do you have any good light reads to recommend? Um, was that part of your nonfiction November? I'd be curious to know. Do writing books count? Of course they do. Fire the haters, finding courage to create online, create online in a critical world by Jillian Johns Rood. Interesting. I've never heard that, but I like the sound of that title. Fire the haters. <laughs> Flames. <laughs> yeah, I guess inspiration books would definitely count as um, light nonfiction. Yeah. There's one, though, the person that I was thinking of, Vivian Swift as the other illustrator. She is a writer illustrator and I don't know, like 10 years ago, she wrote a book uh, or a couple books that was about when wanderers ceased to roam. And she was sort of like a wandering spirit. She would go and travel and, you know, do standby flights and I could never do that because I'm too much of a planner. But she was in a part of her life where she didn't want to do that for whatever reason. And so she had herself stay put in this one little village in Long Island and sketched like every day and sort of wrote and journaled about what came to her. And she just found the most beautiful things like the clock tower that had been there for 80 years and the leaves and people hanging laundry out in the summer. And it was just one of those, it's a light read. It's uh, appreciate the small things. Um, 
And, you know, I can just marvel at how good someone is at watercolors and portraying something with a few little strokes. So, yeah, I like that kind of thing. Um, and if you do and you, you know, want something like that, I would recommend it. Recommend picking up one of those. All right, so I'll leave the question of the day up. And this is my first, like, um, break to remind people about the stoof. So, author side note. Um, it is December, which means that our applications for the AuthorTube Writing Conference are open. So um, I popped the video for a recent video of questions and topics and info in there. Um, and then the other link that's important if you want to apply to give a presentation during the conference on YouTube. Um, we've got a couple of different apps up and the links to explain all about it. If you haven't seen the video or want to go over the writing first are now in the chat. Um, so very helpful. Shannon's put out a very um, definitive guide um, to how to apply and what you're, you'll be getting yourself into. So I just wanted to pop that in the chat and remind everyone, everyone is encouraged to apply. We want to have like robust, excited, enthusiastic writers for 2023. Okay, so we were done with the two readathons and now I've got a couple of rereads. So I don't have them with me. I went and got them in overlays. Look at that, fancy, fancy. So you might have heard me talk about Lori R. King before. I'm kind of doing a reread of all her backlist that I have. <laughs> Come for reads, uh, mystery reads. Uh, this would qualify for Cloak and Dagger Christmas. They're quick reads. They're very entertaining, um, and they're very smart. So if you like a smart historical mystery, Laurie R. King is for you. Um, so these are like uh, books six, seven, eight, somewhere in there in the middle. Um, and for this one, I read the mass market paperback, which is this cover. And this is O Jerusalem by Laurie R. King. The other one, I read the trade paperback. So the covers are like a different era of Justice Hall by Laurie R. King. So both of these uh, uh, involve the same characters and it sort of threw me because I don't think I read them back to back in order, but um, basically the timeline is that, no, let me do it, the publishing. So what she did was she published a book that was, wait, no, I'm going to get it wrong now. So, <laughs> okay. The actual timeline she has in her fictional universe is that um, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Mary Russell were being targeted for assassinations and they couldn't figure out who it was and they were in danger. So they uh, appealed to Mycroft Holmes and he dropped them off in one of three places of their choosing. And uh, Mary Russell opted for Palestine at the time because um, she is part uh, Jewish and that was part of her heritage. And she thought, well, if I'm going to be running from bullets to save my life, might as well pick somewhere that I've always wanted to go. So she goes, and um, yeah, so they, they get plopped into another mystery where they're going to help Mycroft uh, with the British Empire endeavor. And they meet these two brothers uh, who are like, um, well, now I can't do spoilers, can I? Okay, so <laughs> this is how I'll do this. They meet these two brothers, they form a very close relationship because, of course, you are in a place where you're also going to be in danger and you have to trust your, your people. So they develop um, these very close relationships in Palestine while they solve this mystery. So that's one book. That's O Jerusalem. And then later in Justice Hall, they see these two characters, the two brothers, again, but back in England. And they're coming to them for help and being in trouble. But the way they published it was the, the England one first and then the Palestine, that one. So I think I got a little confused. Anyway, standalone, uh, you'd have to read one before the other. Otherwise, spoilers. <laughs> but yes, uh, four-star reads, smart historical mysteries, great for Cloak and Dagger Christmas readathon if you're doing that. And um, I love Lori R. King. She's so smart and so funny. Like there's always like great, great humor in these books. So if you're looking for something that's like relaxing and like fun, but still got tension tension and um plot and action like yeah Laurie Arcane every time uh let's see here 
Not another one. Okay. I'll pop this down. And um, those are my rereads. The next one I have is another overlay. So this I read from the library. It's called Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont by Elizabeth Taylor. It is back, back, backlist. Um, it's a small book. It's a short book. So, you know, shorty September, if that is your thing, or just a small book to get your read number up, if, if that is your thing for the end of 2022. I went back and searched booktube, and I think I got this recommendation from Rosie Cockshut, but I didn't mark her name in Storygraph. So that may be wrong, but Rosie does talk about it like five times in the last year. So it may have been like osmosis. Um, Gina Stanier also talks about this one. It's one of those post-war 50s and 60s. It doesn't fall in May of the Moderns for my readathon, but it is that sweet spot for people who like a cozy British women's fiction type read. So if that is your bag, have I got news for you. Um, I'd never read anything by Elizabeth Taylor. Obviously, I only know about the actress, but there's a like bona fide British writer who wrote prolifically um, in the 50s, I think. And so, yeah, this was lovely. Uh, it's very, it's from a very different time. So you do have to go in with that expectation. Um, let me see if I, I did write a review for this. So let me revisit that so if it gives me anything more. Um, this is Palfrey at the Claremont. Basically, Mrs. Palfrey is an elderly woman who is in the stage between having her own house and running her own house and being a widow um, and not being able to take care of herself and being at assisted living before she goes, right? So there's this awkward period and Elizabeth Taylor has chosen to highlight this hotel that has a subset of live-in guests and it's basically like an elderly hostel. They have, um, I don't know that they do this anymore. Um, it's kind of like we in Portland have some hotels that have been around really long and they're single uh, room occupancy um, for long-term guests. And so they have a different price schedule and they have like uh, hot plates or something like that because they expect people to be like living there as their main mode. And that is affordable for a lot of people who are not able to rent at the Portland rates, which is a lot or, you know, have assisted living or Section 8 or whatever you want to call it. And so um, that is something I only learned about, I like, guess, as a full grown adult. So that was interesting to me. And that sort of crosses over with these um, elderly people in the post-war UK who um, are, are in that weird middle space where they're struggling to maintain the dignity of independent living and whatever, you know, prestige they had as their independent working selves, you know, people from the military, people who are widows, people who um, don't want to depend on their relations because they want to put a stiff upper lip, all these sorts of like image conscious things, which is interesting. And how they interact with each other, how they interact with other people outside their little circle. And um, yeah, so it was really engaging. I said, I gave it 3.75 stars. What an ending. Uh, it's sneaky, so it sort of sneaks up on you. This is an entertaining read, alternating between oh, how sad, because like the, the tragedy of, of people who are forgotten in their old age, and oh, what a bastard, to oh, how nice, because you get sweet little moments between old and young, and sometimes, <laughs> and general setting the world, world to right. So some of that is fun. There are some memorable lines, discoveries, phrasings, but overall, just a nice read of something that's not usually portrayed. The ends of our tawdry lives and how we strive to make them matter. So that is my review on Storygraph. If you're curious where I leave reviews. So yeah, I would recommend that. Nice light read, fiction, women's fiction, mid-century, 20th century. Um, there we go. Flipping right along. I have a couple links for this one. So thanks to Rosie Cockshut or Gina Stanier, whoever I stole this recommendation from and got it from the library. It's very much the sense of May of the Moderns. So I'm sneaking in this little reference here. I run a readathon in May called May of the Moderns 
that is actually highlighting books um, in the modern period um, post-Victorian. So if you're a Victober fan, it's like part two. Uh, and so it's basically 1901 to 1945. Get a good chunk of time. And there's lots of interesting themes in that period, lots of changes the world is going through. So I try to like get a different angle and next year is gonna be the third annual. So feel free to peek at the um, book recommendations. I've got book recommendations on uh, Bookshop to purchase books, but also book recommendations in my wrap ups for those readathons. <sighs> oh, did Merit come in? Yeah, I missed Merit, but I got the bot. <laughs> bot uh, caught my attention. Hey, Barrett, nice to see you. Oh, not feeling great. COVID? Whoa, I missed that. I just saw I just saw the Briley photos on Instagram. I'm sorry, Barrett. Oh, that's rough. Oh, no. That probably means that our karaoke plans for Saturday are next. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll talk to you soon, and we'll see if I can do something with JC. Sorry, friend. That sucks. Uh, let me take this down. That's that book. Um, what else do I have? I have, oh yes, I have the new book, new release in 2022. So for people who are after thrillers, I don't know if there's very many of you on my channel because I don't often review thrillers. I don't often read them. Um, but this one came up and I had to pick it up. So this is, all right, another overlay. Somewhere. Did I not upload? Please hold. There we go. Um, it got away from me. So, The Confessions of Matthew Strong. This is a novel by Usman Power Green. And he's a professor. So he had a really interesting view of um, main character. He made his main character an African-American woman who is a professor. And basically, this book is uh, her experience getting caught up in a plot to, dare I say it, uh, take over or... Um, I don't know, maybe mount an insurrection against the government of the United States. So it's a little too real. Um, let's see. I've got a review for this one that was pretty detailed. Um, oh, and the place that I found this, in case you want to bookmark this, was Sarah DeVello's channel. Um, she's a friend from Mighty Blaze, and she had him on as a guest. So I'm putting that link in the comments interview but also i noticed that when i searched the title his new york times book review came up and i was like oh nice <laughs> well done dr power green so that's pretty cool um but yeah new thriller and crt you know uh content which is excellent so i give it four stars um and i here's here's the review what an interestingly placed book so i definitely call it a thriller but informed also by subtle philosophical underpinnings, because he's a like philosophy professor or um, philosophy of thought is his specialty, I think. Um, and it is firmly buttressed by intimate knowledge of the psychology of the dominant status group under threat. And there's a thing, and I, I tried to get people to help me remember what that is called. I read dominant status group threat in a book, and I can't remember which book it was. I went back and looked and looked and looked, and I couldn't find it. So anyway, it's the idea that when you're the dominant status in a society, dominant group in a society, you are always feeling under threat of losing that dominant status. So uneasy is the head that wears the crown kind of mentality. And you know, like um, this produces lots of pathologies. So that was really interesting as a psychological thriller. Um, this is a first person narrative uh, from this African-American woman professor uh, who gets kidnapped by a white supremacist and she's made to write his like apologia. And so you're going through the lead up to 
the heist the kidnapping and then like you actually go through it and like all the pieces and the different minds of the people and um yeah just too believable um what goes on so let's see what else did i say um She's an immensely smart protagonist becoming the center of a man's plot to change history and fighting him back, fighting back against him. The editing was fine. The characterization of the main character was crystal clear. Family relationships were real and heartfelt, and I loved the message. So, yes, it's a yes for me. Um, and then the final thing that I said was, it is highly sensationalist, which I normally sort of shy away from, and that there's a kidnapping, and there's all these girls who are going missing and you know I tend to shy away from that because um, just like in true crime the highly publicized stuff reinforces the fact that you know women and girls need to be protected and that can often be a white supremacist touch point and reinforce the structure that white men need to be on top and, and blah 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 so anyway highly sensationalist premise but it felt all too credible so it's it's swapped because it's black girls in the South that are going missing. And um, so that's a crusade I can get behind. So it was really, really interesting. And I do recommend The Confessions of Matthew Strong. Um, Tyler may have to read this one. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's your genre. Barrett, but I think you might find it interesting. And I don't remember it being like it, it's fast paced, so I don't remember it taking too long for me to get through. Yeah. Okay, so winding up, um, I've got two more books. I've got one by my amigo JD Estrada, which also did I not make a <laughs> overlay for that one? Arr! Okay, well, let's share the screen then for. Ta -ta -da. Um, Katie Strata, 2020. So if you don't know about 2020, it is a, um, a book with a bit of a history. We've got 2020, which is JD's first effort in which he has some English and some Spanish essays, poems, and uh, short stories. And so it's like a mix of forms, which is really cool. And then he did... 2020, I think, which was all Spanish, so he had to translate some, and then he did 2020, which is all English, so he had to translate some the other way. And he came across this cool thing, and I don't know if he invented the word or what, but this thing called trans transcreated. So instead of saying translated, because the ideas that he's expressing are so specific to one or the other of his languages, Spanish or English, he had to rework the expression to be intelligible in the other language, which is super fascinating. Um, did I miss popping it up? I did. Okay. So this is what it looks like on the Kindle. Uh, I read 2020 Essays, Poetries, and Short Stories by J.D. Estrada. And I've got a fun... Uh, let me pop over to my review. Fun review on here. I gave some of my, my favorites a shout out. So um, let's see. Uh, there's a smorgasbord of options, uh, experiments, hints, and musings. It is much in the author author's previous style of nonfiction. It's a little rambly, a little thoughtful, and it's aiming to entertain the reader with wordplay while also connecting with the reader at another level, like a deeper level, which I love. Um, there's a short story in English that I loved called Celesteers, which is like a little water sprite. And you get in like a sci-fi for the water sprite and his team of water trying to make it down to Earth. And I loved it. It's environmentalist. Like, it's not usually what JD does, but it was like, hey, it's a story for me. Um, then for the, the essay that I loved, he has We Are Living in 1984, where his like decisive this is what I think you can take it or leave it really comes in. Um, it's not a whole diatribe. He takes up two specific examples uh, where he sees Orwell's nightmare coming true. The minimization of the individual's worth for the benefit of the corporate entity, which we can definitely talk to because he's got day job experience four days and can talk to you about that. Um, and the smiling facade and rest restricted flow of truth that preserves the fig leaf of capitalism, in my opinion. Um, but as I say, at least that's how I interpreted it. Um, 
he leaves room for ambiguity. He's decisive about his view, but he also talks about um, trends and layers of intention that could be interpreted different ways, which I liked. And then finally, he's got in the trans-created essays, so nonfiction, creative nonfiction, short story, what is it? I don't know, you have to tell. Um, changing Lanes, and all I wrote in my notes is, Gah. <laughs> he really slows down the pacing to make his point, which is like, you know, emotional gut punch. So it's set in, on um, in the middle of traffic on the freeway. It's measured in billboards being on the freeway. It's felt in helplessness about this person's realizations in the car. And then finally, like, there's this personal connection that is the gut punch. So I loved it. Loved it. So... Yay. Oh, look, look, we've got a friend uh, who also left a review. Yay. The bear gets another little like screen time here. <laughs> kind of cool. So, yep. So that was 2020. That sound, it seems like a really long time ago that I read it, but it was November. <laughs> seamless, seamless, right? Um, and then finally, I've got something on my ancient TBR or a TBR veteran, depending on how you want to hashtag it um this this bubba right so this has been on my shelf for years and it's one of these um historical fiction dual timeline somewhat supernatural um tales that i'm just a sucker for because they call out diana gebeldon and susanna kersley and some of my favorite authors but this one didn't really make it for me so not to end the video on a Sour note, but uh, Barbara Erskine's Sleeper's Castle. It's a backlist. Obviously, it's been on my shelf for several years. Um, it didn't need to be this long. Uh, the premise and some of the book I really liked. It's a woman who's in modern times who has just um, lost her partner. And instead of like dealing with the grief peacefully as an artist in the modern time should be able to, the ex of the guy comes in and he was actually still married to her because it was such a nightmare. He just let it go and like didn't push it. So she comes in, takes back the house, burns all her things and letters and like is a colossal bitch basically. So the woman artist runs off to her friend's house and does a house sitting gig. She's in Wales in this castle called Sleeper's Castle that has like a thousand years of history. And um, then she starts to get these dreams. And so in the dreams, she sees what's happening back in time in the castle. So there's the earlier timeline around 1400 with the Welsh, uh, one of the Welsh wars for independence and a, an actual historical figure. And that's pretty cool. And then we've got uh, her also having dreams about the colossal bitch lady in her old house and like what's going on there. So she draws the bitch lady character to her and she's a nightmare and she's like trying to do her harm at the same time she's trying to have these dreams to see what happens with this historical figure and the girl who lives in the castle who has an eye on history so all elements that i love but the emotional stuff was not there for me there was too much plot stuff there was too much back and forth the villain the bitch lady like very, very just straight bitch, and you know, her the resolution was not satisfying for me. So, you know, 2.75, there's some good parts, and the premise was good. And if you want to like cozy up to some Welsh history and supernatural vibes, like it might be for you, but um, it was it was too slow for me, probably because I had so many other books on the go that were so much more engaging. Check out the December TBR for those, right? So I'm glad that I will now have space for like three more books on my channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Mia. Hello, hello. Welcome. So that is about it for the Wednesday wrap up. Um, the last thing I wanted to pop on as a, ooh, look what's going on in the booktube world is um, a little birdie named Shannon told me about the Tuber Book Club reading my book, Dulcie's Legacy. Coincidentally, the one the parrot read. Um, as well as Fable's Passages. And they're going to read it and discuss it. So I'm a little terrified, but a little excited. I think it's either on January 17th or January 24th. So this is my 
in, invigorating my audience to go raid, check out the Tuber Book Club. I think it's just the email sign up and then you're you're able to vote in the polls and whatnot for future author tuber books to read with the book club. Um so yeah, so that is the the long playlist link. Sorry, I thought I had a, a bitly for that. <laughs> um but yeah, yeah, this was my 2014 book. So, you know, almost 10 years ago. <laughs> and we'll see if they tear it to shreds. It's young adult, it's got supernatural in it. Um some other people haven't liked it. Some other people have. So we'll see, we'll see what the Tuber Book Club thinks of it. Yay! Yeah, as soon as they figure out which date it is, um, we'd love to see you there. I will definitely be there in the chat on a Tuesday. Ooh. Okay, I may have to switch my schedule because it's usually when I'm planning for the blaze. So we'll see. Uh, Rachel, hello. I've been lurking today. <laughs> Excuse me. We're happy I get to catch in person. Yay! Hold on. Okay. Okay, there we go. We're good. We're calm again. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out closer to the time. We've got loads of stuff to do in December, so just putting it on your radar. Um, if you're interested in a YA historical fantasy the Tuber Book Club by Books with Adrian will be um, talking about my book, Dulcie's Legacy, in January. Hello, Laura. Welcome in. Oh, in a work meeting. <laughs> nice. Um, let's see. What else do I have coming up? Well, I did have a list here. I'll put it up anyway, just in case. Um, oh, okay. It says February, but no specific date. Oh, nice. Well, there's a romantic element in it. So we'll just make it the, uh, we'll make it the, um, February book choice. I like that even better. Yeah, no worries. So that is my Wednesday wrap up of November and a little bit of December. As I said, I'm very excited about the December reads. These are some of them. Um, what is next for the channel is. Friday's author interview with author tuber Rachel D. Adams. Very excited. Uh, then Saturday might have holiday karaoke. Um, TBD, we'll see. And then Sunday, it's a packed weekend, y'all. Uh, I have both my Patreon book club where we're going to be re reviewing um, our experiences of Laura Elena Donnelly's Amberlo, the glam queer spy thriller. Amazing. And then I'll also be talking with Sandy of Ms. Reads a Lot about this book, which is a bit shorter, Regeneration by Pat Barker, which is a backlist beauty. Um, it's it's amazing so far. I haven't finished it. I'm about halfway through, and I'm going to devote today to finishing it so that I can get my ducks in a row to talk with Sandy. I think this is going to be her seventh, second um, live. So come and support and be really nice in the comments and bop those bots for us, please. <laughs> um so yeah, so this is offline with the book club, but this is going to be online with Sandy of Miss Reads a lot. I'm very excited. And again, coming up, this will be reviewed in the next one, Best American Science and Nature Writing and Writing Sweetgrass. Ugh, so good. I'm about halfway through that too. December Reads. So there were some standouts in November that I was really fascinated by and loved and reviewed heartily. But um, overall, only 10 books. That was much slower, slower month. For me than than usual. Uh, Barrett's going back into a cover coma. Heart you friend. Text you later about karaoke. I can host the doubt all the singing with this cough throat. Yeah, that's soon. Sounds good. Hey Barrett, feel better. Uh, yeah, feel better. Get better. Yeah, that's a bummer. After all this time, like it's kind of like lights going out on candles. Like everyone's getting COVID. <sighs> it battled so valiantly, right? Okay, so those are those are the next things up. Um, I didn't hear about any other light nonfiction reads besides Shannon's, so um, I don't know. Maybe we all are like heavy nonfiction processors. <laughs> could be, could be. Um, but for now, that's all that I've got for you today for that Wednesday wrap up. I hope it's been entertaining and informative for your books that you've never heard of, um, you know, what you come here for because you're the queen of books you've never heard of. Um, 
but we'll see you again soon for Friday or Saturday or Sunday. So stay tuned and happy reading, everybody. See you again soon.